Hi everyone, this is Arkady Freckman and welcome to another episode of Last Week Tonight where we answer your questions and we talk about your comments. We're only about five days from being current, so let's get into it. The first question is from a Merkel Severe or Severe and he or she, I believe it's a she, asks, Hello, we're from Florida and last year in May, my husband was stopped at a red light and a semi was in the left turning lane to make a U-turn. When the light changed, the trailer somehow caught up in my husband's car, dragging his car along with the truck. He didn't go in an ambulance, but he has been doing the treatments. Last Friday, he has finished his clinic treatments. He has gotten the shots, injections in his back, and today he is doing radio frequency ablation treatment. His lawyer says she is going after the max of $10 million. But realistically speaking, what do you think his claim can settle for? Thanking you in advance. Well, you know, it's a good question. Um, in Florida, like I don't know where in Florida, I don't know if it matters that much. I'm not really familiar with every, you know, jurisdiction in Florida. But I would say if he's had radio frequency ablation, it should be at least a six figure case. In New York, that would be a six figure case or close, like 80, 90,000 at the lowest if it's a radio frequency ablation. And the fact that he's had injections, I don't know what type of injections. I'm assuming you may be referring to epidural steroid injections. And those we've settled anywhere from 20, 30,000 if people have only gotten like say one injection all the way up to I think the highest we had with just injections and nothing else was about 150,000. That was also against a tractor trailer. So if he's had both the uh, series of three epidural steroid injections as well as radio frequency ablation and he has a herniated disc and serious a debilitating injury that's not likely to get better, then I think that, you know, the total settlement can easily be in the six figures. It's hard for me to say exactly how much, but it should be more than 100,000. So have his lawyer file the lawsuit, keep, you know, keep pushing, make sure that the lawyer is a trial lawyer. And that's good that they have 10 million in insurance. And that's good that you know that because a lot of people don't know. And, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So you're on the right track. Okay, good luck to you. Okay, and the next question is from Jam Slam. And she says, thank you for continuing this wonderful series in 2023 and answering my questions. Yes, I ended up getting epidural injections in both cervical and lumbar. Thankfully, I am pain-free for the first time since my accident. Thanks again. Now, that's great to hear. I'm wishing you a full recovery. I mean, health is everything, right? That's the most important thing. And I'm also really glad to hear that the epidural injections helped and that you're feeling better. What I've seen a lot of the time with my clients is that an epidural, what they're doing is if you have a herniated disc, right, and the disc has exploded and the liquid inside the disc is leaking outside the disc and touching those nerve roots, what the epidural will do is it'll numb the area. So it's like a temporary relief, right? Because it's a numbing agent, it's a steroid, and you're not gonna feel the pain, but it doesn't cure the herniation. So then once the medicine wears off, the pain could come back. And if that happens, there's another procedure called a percutaneous discectomy, where they actually remove a striker decompressor, which is a type of like almost like a, a spinning uh, needle goes in and it like suctions out uh, and decompresses the disc so that the disc is a perfect circle without those leaks. So that could be something that you may need in the future, but that's great that, I mean, sometimes I guess an epidural could be a cure if, if, if hopefully the pain just goes away. We don't want the pain coming back. So good luck to you, but that's just been my experience. But again, I'm not a doctor, I'm just a lawyer. So, you know, but that's what, that's been my experience with some of my clients. Okay. And then the next question is from MJ623NY. Arkady, you need to look into CPTSD. Dr. Kim Sage on YouTube has devoted so much to this topic and how it differs from PTSD. I believe I have CPTSD. I discovered this myself. My 2019 car accident exacerbated it. Okay, so that's interesting. So I'll take a look at that. I'm going to see what that is. Maybe that's a type of, we're talking about post-traumatic stress disorder, right? That's um, PTSD. So I guess CPTSD is a type of maybe a specific type of post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. And I think I did take a quick look just when, when I got the comment about five days ago, I took a quick look at this Dr. Kim Sage just on their, their page and it looked very interesting. So I'm gonna try to take a deeper dive when I have some time and read up about it. And thank you for sharing that with me. 
Okay, then Thomas Robichaud says, this guy is on his game. Thank you so much, Thomas. And Shelby Thompson asks, what if it's a broken tibia and fibula with surgery and it happens on the job? Ballpark figure, machine malfunction, plates and screws, doctor says I will need more surgeries. Yeah, I mean, the injury is very, very serious. I'm sorry to hear that happen to you. The injury is very serious. An injury like that could definitely be a million or more. Now, now liability, I don't know. Machine malfunction, depending on how clear it is, how easy it is to prove. If you can prove they were liable for the malfunction, uh, you can't usually sue your employer because that'll be workers' comp, but maybe you could sue a third party. And then if you have a personal injury case, it should be a pretty big amount. If it's a um, workers' comp case, you could also be entitled to some benefits, but it's not at usually as much as a personal injury. Okay, and then SARS Logistics says, I had to get a loan from a funding company. They charge 16.9% each six months. Annually, it's 34%. And he stopped counting after three years. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the times that's what they'll do. They'll, they'll also sometimes put a cap on it, like a ceiling, so it won't go over, let's say, three times the principal. I don't know how much you borrowed, but what you could also do is at the end of the case, when your lawyer has settled the case and actually received the funds and put the funds into his or her client escrow account, right? That's a special account for clients. So from there, the lawyer can then contact them and reduce the lien. For example, if they say, hey, our lien because we paid like, you know, 3,000 to you and it's been 34% and now we want like, you know, 12,000. Well, the lawyer says, look, I have the money in my bank account ready to pay you, but I can't authorize 12,000. I could pay you. My client has said they'll agree to like 6,000, you know, double your principal. How about that? And then you negotiate it and see what the best deal you could do. And then you just uh, you give the A-OK and then your lawyer pays them. So that's usually how it works. So, but you have to usually when you have the money, to pay them, that's when you negotiate because otherwise it's like, you know, what are we talking about? You don't have the money. What if I negotiate with you now, you know, and then the funding company will say, well, what if I negotiate with you now? But then like, you know, the, the, the it takes another five years, right? So then the interest keeps rising. So it's best to do that um, when you have the money to pay them off. Okay, the next question. Eduardo Romero says, I got assaulted about five years ago, got hit behind my head. I did not pass out, just some dizziness. Didn't have any symptoms for about a year and it seems to be getting worse every year. Barely last year, I went to finally get checked out and I was referred to a neurologist and an EEG and MRI done on me and my results said I had nothing and everything seemed to be fine. And then it got worse and basically I don't know if the hit behind my head is the cause of my symptoms. My symptoms are short-term memory loss, vision problems, double vision, trouble with my speech, trouble with balance, isolation, trouble being around people, do you think I can possibly have a kind of brain injury? I mean, you know, again, I'm not a doctor, but that sounds like pretty serious. Those are serious. Those are symptoms that are consistent with traumatic brain injury. So I would get that checked out. Maybe what you could do is go to a, a another doctor, like a neurologist who specializes in traumatic brain injury, and they could do a workup for you. And then also perhaps they could send you then to another specialist, like a, like a TBI neuroradiologist that could do some other testing. Like there's diffuse tensor imaging, there's other types of radiological studies they could do. And then there's testing for balance. Like for example, a VNG is a test for balance and that's the vestibular function. So if you're having balance issues, and then you could also see even a neuropsychologist. And then what they could do is examine your memory loss and have you and examine how that's affected you. So there's a few different specialists, but usually a doctor that specializes in TBI could, could help you. A regular neurologist sometimes just an EEG might not be enough. That's really, that's really like a, you know, very uh, basic test. So you might need a little bit more in-depth testing because TBI is very hard to diagnose. Okay. Then we have uh, Ricky or Risi. He says, um, this is very good information. We sent out an inspector and oh man, the whole place has code violations on the ground and around. Yeah, that's good. It's good to, you know, have an expert go there. I believe this is the case where there was like a hole and his uh, bicycle got into the hole. And yeah, you need an inspector to see what the code violations are and that'll make the case stronger. So that, that's good. And um, yeah, he says severe damage codes. Uh, with other things like fire hydrants. I don't know if you can get that in because, you know, the, if your case is about like a hole where 
you, either you or your vehicle, like the bicycle, got into the hole, I think you have to limit the, the expert's testimony about what caused your accident. If they have other violations, like a ceiling is leaking or you know flooding somewhere else or a fire hydrant, that's probably not going to be in evidence. The judge will exclude that. But and, you know the fact that the place is crawling with violations is always bad for them and good for you. Maybe your lawyer could somehow like, you know, sneak that in or use that as a negotiating tactic during uh, settlement discussions. And let's see, what other questions or comments do we have? Araf says, since you said there are many of these cases, maybe a part two, and he's referring to spinal fusion jury verdicts, a part two for that, and talk about bigger, bigger cases, five million and higher. Okay, absolutely. I'll try to do some research and, and do that video. And then Teresita says, I have a question regarding my situation. I have a work-related injury. I'm a CNA, a nursing assistant, working in a dementia unit. I tried to put a patient in bed and she suddenly had, uh, and, and she suddenly has left or leg weakness, almost falling from bed. So I lifted her up, pulled her in the middle of the bed that caused me back injury. The problem is they did not address the problem right away. They still made me work for another hours after the injury. This injury led to a fusion, L4, L5, S1 fusion, six screws and a rod in my spinal. And I'm seeing pain management because it gives me so much pain. I suffer for more than two years now, and it even gives me a frozen shoulder and that never healed also. The company offered me 130K, but my lawyer was trying to get 180K, but I believe it's still not enough. I developed scoliosis and my L2, L3, and also mildly bulging and sciatic nerve is giving me severe pain in my legs that I can barely walk. Do you think I should get the 130? Thank you. Um, I'm 50 when I got injured and now I'm 53 turning 54 this coming February. Oh, and the adjuster lowered my lost wages also from 624 down to 520. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a workers comp case, so I'd probably defer to your lawyer's advice, but you know, I definitely go for the, as much as you can, if you think you can get 180. Workers comp is usually limited to the, either the lost wages and also the medical bills that they pay. You can't really recover for personal injury in workers' comp, right? Because you can't sue your employer for personal injury, for negligence. You could sue any third party, but what your employer can give you is they can give you the medical care, right? The cost of medical care, and they could also pay you your lost salary. So altogether, you could do, in New York at least, you could do what's known as a Section 32, a lump sum settlement where you get a larger amount, like, like 200000 but then you stop getting those smaller payments, like she was saying, 500000 520000 you stop getting those uh, payments once every two weeks, but then you get the big uh, amount. So yeah, but I, it's hard for me to say. I'm not really, I don't really handle workers' comp, so I would defer to your lawyer. I do know a lot of excellent workers' comp lawyers here in New York, and I probably could also find one in your jurisdiction. If you're not in New York, if you needed help, just let us know, and I'll be happy to help. Okay, let's see what other uh, questions we have here. Kevin Chenoweth says, not a fan of the new videos, too much covered in one video. I like the older format with videos on a given subject. Okay, no, thank you. Thank you for, for telling us that. I like when people are honest and tell us what they really think, you know, that's good. Yeah, I'm gonna try to do both. I know some people do like this type of format because I'm answering their questions, you know, this is what they care about. But I understand that maybe it's too much, that there's a lot of different questions. You may not be interested in all of them. And what I also do is I put timestamps so you could see what the questions are. So you can just click on whichever questions interest you. Like, for example, if you care about car crashes, you could skip the slip and fall questions. Um, and But I'm going to do the topic videos as well. I want to do more videos about verdicts uh, and like about different types of verdicts as well as different types of situations like construction, trip and fall, premises liability, more of a deep dive into different types of injuries and different types of incidents. So we could talk about verdicts and as well as, you know, different types of topics. If you have any ideas for topics, just let me know. Just say, please do a video about, you know, X, Y, or Z. And I'm happy to do that. Because I'm always trying to, you know, I'm actually starting to build out like a content uh, calendar. I was actually at a legal summit. I just got back uh, last night and they were talking about everything with law, the business of law, uh, as well as trial work. It was a very nice summit. It was like a mastermind. Only a few people get invited to this, right? And a lot of the lawyers were really top of their game. There were lawyers from Louisiana, Ohio, Indianapolis. There was one lawyer uh, who bases uh, his firm in Kentucky. He's a real big, big 
um, you know, advertiser. He has like billboards and advertising, but he's also a trial lawyer. He got a $10 million verdict. So anyway, so what they were talking about at this conference, uh, they were saying actually that one of the things that you should do as, as a lawyer is you should try to, you know, market yourself in different areas. Like you could do a little bit of marketing on like, for example, YouTube answering questions. You could also do like TikTok. He does TikTok. He does uh, Instagram. I haven't done those other channels, but I might, I may do them in the future, but yeah, it's very, very interesting. And, um, and he was saying like, you know, you want to be able to answer your, um, you know, answer your viewers, answer your uh, audience. So that, that's very, very important. Okay. I hope this has been helpful and let's, uh, we're going to continue. We're going to do more questions soon. Yeah. Oh, so we were speaking about the, the conference. I just got back from the conference last night. So one of the interesting things on this topic with, um, you know, doing um, like too many things in one video or answering people's questions. So what they were talking about at the conference was the lawyers were actually creating like a content calendar or even like a content factory, right? And they had all this different content. Now, some of the content is very, very substantive about, you know, law, about, you know, whatever, something about specific topics, people's questions, and other content, like for different platforms, like TikTok, for example, was more like, hey, what are you eating? Or what, what's your diet? Or you're going shopping, what are you buying? He's buying like a Gatorade or whatever, or water. So, you know, it depends on what platform you're, you're, you're there for. So I think like this platform is more educational, right? And then if we do something else, like for another platform, like TikTok or Instagram, we could try to be a little bit more fun or a little bit more, you know, about other things. Like I could, one lawyer is doing like pizza reviews. Like, you know, I don't, uh, you know, I like pizza. Maybe I can do a few pizza reviews too. Or uh, I like uh, sushi. Maybe I can do like good sushi places here in New York City. Uh, one of these books that I was reading recently uh, I actually listened to the audiobook. It's called Deep Work. It's really, really a good book by Cal Newport. It shows you, um, you know, how, why, why deep work is meaningful, why it's important, how it's rare. And then he shows you how to do deep work, how to work deeply, you know, how to really focus on something, block out your time and not like waste time. Because there's so many distractions now. There's so many distractions with social media, with you know, bells going off, notifications going off. It's hard to work deeply, but this, it's a very good book. I liked it. it. Talks about being able to embrace boredom and really focus and quitting social media. And then he talks about draining the shallows, not doing the shallow or mindless work. So, you know, it's, it's a good book. It, it had a lot of takeaways. Maybe that's one of the things I could talk about on the, on the other platforms is like quick takeaways, like 15 second takeaways from something like that, like a book. Um, but anyway, and then let's see what else. So, uh, and then another response to this same question about these videos, right? The last week tonight videos where I answer your questions was somebody was saying, honestly, I like the fast ones where he gets down to business. You have to remember we are giving him limited information compared to our lawyers actually handing, handling our cases. So if you know how to ask the question and break it down, this man is extremely well at giving that breakdown in a timely manner hitting everyone an answer or giving everyone an answer. They are somewhat looking for from a professional that would actually charge for advice at all. You want to know why this man is super successful? It's because obviously money is not an issue to him. He lives his work and helping people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I really try to help people. I try to answer everyone's questions. Just like the real thing that I would need is like I was saying um, in another video, a little bit of the facts, you know, like what happened, almost so I could see it happening, right? Like I'm watching it on Netflix. I'm seeing it happen. Then I could get, then I could know the liability a little bit better than if you just tell me, you know, um, I don't know, what's my herniation worth? Well, that's too general. I don't know, right? Every herniation could be worth, a herniation could be worth five grand. I remember there was a video I did about somebody out in California who got 12 million on a herniation, right? So there's a big, big difference. So you have to tell me a little bit about the facts and then it'll tell, me, tell me about your injuries, how it's affected your life in addition to the medical injuries. And I could give you my best, uh, you know, estimate. But remember, it's just an estimate. Okay, um, let's see what other questions we have. Here's a question. Um, Hi, attorney. Good day. All videos are very helpful. I just have a question. I got injured at work lifting a patient, a bulging disc or herniated disc that leads to a fusion surgery and discectomy. I have six screws. I think this is the same question we just read, right? I think it's the same question. Maybe she was just 
asking it in a different way. So I don't want to read the whole question. I think I said here, I'm so, so sorry to hear that. What state did it happen in? And she said, it's in Michigan. And I said, I'm not too familiar with workers comp because that is also state specific, right? So that's why you might need a workers comp lawyer in Michigan. But if you need a second opinion, I might be able to find one for you. Uh, but yeah, I specialize in third party personal injury lawsuits, but it definitely sounds like she has a serious case and it should be worth a substantial amount. And if it was in New York, I would say I would have the ortho doctor review it and it should be paid for by workers comp. I think the issue is that, yeah, she wanted to, to get another review to have a, poten a potentially other surgery. Um, and he was trying to refer her and the pain management couldn't help, I see. I mean, she was wanted to bill workers comp for an orthopedic doctor to check her out. Yeah, I mean, usually the way it works, at least here in New York, is you go before an administrative judge and then you have the insurance carrier there. They have You have their lawyers. They're the ones paying for it. And then you have you and your lawyers. And then you explain, look, I, I've gotten all I can get from pain management. Now I need an orthopedic doctor. Please authorize it. They usually just say, yes, you can authorize it. And then you can go to the, to the doctor. I'm not sure how Michigan works, but it should be something similar. Okay. Let's see what other questions. Here's a question about living in an apartment, but I believe this question had to do with something with 60 day notices. I don't think it was a personal injury question. I tried to answer it in the text as best I could, but it's probably not worth discussing here because it's not related to any kind of injury. It's more like a landlord tenant issue. And then Sugar Bay says, is mediation the same as a CMC? And is a CMC free or who pays for it? So yeah, it should be the same. It should be free. A CMC, I think what she's referring to is a case management conference. So what that basically is, is in New York, we have what's known as a preliminary conference, which is the first conference. And then you have a scheduling order for everything. And then later on, you have a compliance conference to make sure that whatever was ordered in the preliminary conference actually gets done, right? Actually gets complied with, hence the name compliance conference. And in a case management conference, I guess that's something similar that they have in other states, probably just to manage the case, right? Everything about the case. How are we going to go about settling? Are we going to do mediations? Do we need to do discovery, like document exchange? Do we need to do motions? Here's your motion uh, deadlines. Do we need to do um, depositions? Who, who do we want to depose and by when? And then, you know, you can ask for extensions if things change. Uh, so that's usually, yeah, both sides and the judge have a conference and decide how to handle the case. So it's the, basically everyone decides how to manage that case. So that is a little different from a mediation because a mediation is just an attempt to settle the case. It's not necessarily, um, you know, managing the case and all of these things that I just talked about, but it's just settlement. It's just putting a number on it, right? That everyone is going to agree on. And a mediation is also different because it's non-binding and it's a negotiation, right? So I might go into a mediation. I might say, here, look at these videos. Look at these documents. Here's my, here's my client. Here's reasons why I'm asking for blah, 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 this amount. And then they might say, okay, we're going to give you some money, but we think that's too high. And then you try to come down into the middle where both sides can agree. And if you can't uh, agree, then, uh, you know, you could say, no, thank you. Let's just go to trial, right? Because you still have your trial date from the case management uh, conference. So, yeah. And then, oh, she replied. She says, thank you. That is exactly what I'm referring to. Okay, great. So, yeah, that's what it is. So, it's a little bit different. I mean, that, that's basically how it's different in that in a case management conference, it results in an order. And an order is not like, you know, an order is an order. You have to do its mandate, mandatory. You have to do what the judge says. Otherwise, the judge could get mad and just dismiss your case, right? But with a mediation, it's all non-binding. It's usually a retired judge or a private mediator. And you try to settle a lot of the times they do work and they do result in settlements, but you don't have to settle. Okay. What other questions do we have? This is an interesting comment about everything is being done to reduce the world's population. Paraquat. Oh, paraquat. Yeah, that's a da dangerous chemical that is being used in farming and I believe it causes cancer. Yeah, we have a few of those cases. That's a really horrible. And then something about frogs and... Frogs of the same sex can't create more frogs. I don't know. This is a little too weird for me. <laughs> I can't really comment on frogs having sex. That's not my uh, area of expertise, at least not yet. Okay. Uh, very important information. God bless. And they're referring to, you need to know this about independent medical exams. Yeah, that's actually, a, I was just actually looking at that. That's an interesting uh, video because we talked about some of the 
dangers of independent, they're not really independent, they're defense medical exams and the ways that they trick people. So that would actually be interesting content for more of a short form, either YouTube shorts or maybe TikTok or, or Instagram or something like that, Facebook, like, like shorter form where we could be like, look, watch out for this, boom, 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 and it's like 15 seconds. So I was gonna maybe take some notes and, and do a few videos about that in the future. And then Laura Bess asks, what is this umbrella insurance? Is it something that the person has or the insurance company itself? Yeah, so umbrella insurance is something that the insurance policy, the insurance company has, right, for that insured, for their policy holder. So it's excess insurance, it's beyond the policy. So for example, like you get hit by a John Smith, right, and they disclose, hey, John Smith has 250,000 in insurance. He might have Allstate or Geico or Liberty Mutual, Progressive. What you wanna do is send them a request and say, look, thank you for telling me that you have 250,000. Is that all of the insurance? Is there any excess, umbrella, supplemental, concurrent, or any other policies in addition to this 250 that you've already told me about, right? Is there anything else? And then they have to tell you, yes, there's an umbrella, there's an excess, there's a, you know, whatever, whatever there is. And then you know all the coverage. Once you know all the coverage, then you're in a better position to negotiate with them. You don't want to negotiate and then you don't even know what they have, right? That doesn't make sense. <laughs> this just doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Like one time I had a case, I think I talked about it earlier, where I thought it was one million and I was, or, or, or two million. They said it was two million and then they were going to uh, settle uh, for, for a certain amount. And then, and then right on the eve of trial, they're like, oh, by the way, we have 25 million in excess. Well, that changes the game, right? Now that you know they have 25 million, you don't have to demand 2 million anymore, you could demand, you know, much more, depending on the injury. That particular injury was a serious injury. There was a spinal fusion, so it could be worth more than, than 1 million or 2 million or whatever they told you about originally. So it's really important to find that out. And then I had this uh, video called, How Much Is a Herniated Disc Worth? What's My Case Worth? series, where we talked about bulging discs and herniated discs. And somebody asked, what about a herniated disc with a right neural foraminal stenosis? Yeah, I mean, I can't really comment on what that would be worth without knowing, you know, like I just talked about what the liability is and all the other factors. So it's the best thing to do would be fill out that little form that we have in the description. It's called a, I believe it's called Formaloo, but it has just a little information like your name, your email, the facts, the injury information, and then you just fill that out. It should only take like 30 seconds and then we could possibly help you and uh, try to answer your question with more specificity. But yeah, the fact that you have stenosis is, is, is serious and the herniation is always serious. So it just depends on, you know, how everything happened and things like that. Then Deborah DeSanto asks, just a question, can you sue for a failed laminectomy still having back pain and leg pain? Yeah, you can sue for a failed laminectomy as long as it was, you know, medical, that's medical malpractice. If there was medical negligence, a medical mistake, then you could sue for that. You'd have to have proof, like you'd have to have another doctor review everything and say, look, this doctor made X, Y, and Z mistake. This was the departure or deviation from good and accepted medical practice. And that's what caused your injury. Like it wasn't just um, the fact that you already needed this surgery, this laminectomy, this isn't normal. This is because of the doctor's negligence. So those are the two things. Number one, that they departed or deviated from good and accepted practice. And number two, it's that they um, that the, the, that there's causation, right? That their mistake is what caused, at least in New York, it's that their mistake was a substantial factor in bringing about the end result, right? The injury. So it has to be from their mistake. So medical malpractice cases, yeah, they're very they're very interesting, and um, you know we do we do some medical malpractice cases. We try to only do them if it's a really really serious injury because they're very very costly and complicated. Um, I was actually watching uh, an interesting CLE, a continuing legal education. I was just going through my notes to see if it's in this legal uh, folder or not. I don't, I don't think it's in, it might've been in a different legal, uh, in a different legal pad. It wasn't in this one, but there was an interesting um, commentary, a lawyer, and he was talking about medical malpractice and he was trying to break it down with fewer questions and explaining how to you know, uh, know if you have a good med mal case or not. I thought it might be helpful for this particular viewer. Um, or actually, here it is. Okay, yeah, here it is. I found it. It's in this legal pad, the white one. Basically, it's just how to evaluate and develop your med mal cases. You just ask these three questions. Number one, 
and this is when they say they, they're referring to the doctor, the doctor you're suing. Number one, what were they required to do that they did not do? Okay, meaning what was the doctor required to do? Number two, when were they required to do it? And number three, what difference would it make? Meaning, like what difference did the fact that they were negligent or they made a mistake make? And that's what I, what I meant when I said it has to, the causation is important. So yeah, that's usually how, a simple way to, to look at it. Okay. Then uh, there's a question here that the injury happened on both property lines. So the question is, can we go after both property owners insurance, the gas station and the guy that lives overseas since the property line cuts exactly through the manhole where I fell? Yeah, I would say then you could sue for both. Yeah, absolutely. Whoever, if it's, you got to look at the actual property line, or have your engineer examine it. Usually it could be like one or both, but if it really is down the middle and the manhole cover, it, you know, is on both properties, then both of them would be liable. Then you, you should sue both of them. Absolutely. That's, that's the best way to do it. Okay. And let me see what other questions we have. Oh, Ray asks, is it true that 95% of cases settle before trial? Why is that, please? I think I did another video. I like that question. That's a good question. Like, why, why do cases, you know, why do most cases settle? So I did a separate video to answer that. But the quick version is because, you know, du during litigation, you get so much information about everything, right? Because why do cases like not settle? Because we don't, because the insurance company doesn't know anything about you, right? They don't know. Are you a fraudster? Did you really even get hurt there? Um, you know, is it really, are your injuries really because of this fall or this uh, car crash? Or are you just trying to pull one over on them, right? So that's why they have discovery where they could question you. They ask you questions. You have to give them documents like your medical records. And they have to also give you documents too. But th that's the point, right? That you have this whole process. And through the process, you answer a lot of the questions like what venue, where are we going to go to trial? Who is the plaintiff? Has this been a life-changing forever injury or is it just a little boo-boo that's going to go away, right? And then they know how much to pay you. And plus, they have access to all the prior cases, either through the jury verdict reporter, the precedents, other case law. And then they know, like, liability-wise, are we likely to be at fault? And damages-wise, what is something like this worth in this particular uh, jurisdiction, this particular location. So that, so the more discovery you do, the more litigation you do, the more you answer all these questions, right? So all these question marks, almost like imagine all of these questions are like little boxes and then they all get checked off. Now you answered everything. Now both sides, the plaintiff who's suing and the defendant who's defending and the insurance company, they all know the answers to everything. So once they know the answers to everything, they know what's likely to happen. So that's why why go to trial then, right? We, let's just settle for what this is worth. And so if both parties are, are, are fair, that's what happens. Okay. And let me see if we have any other questions. Patrick Kelly says, I need you. My lawyer thinks he's Johnny Cochran. He acts like he's King S-H-I-T, <laughs> when in reality, he's Jack S-H-I-T. Oh, wow. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, I mean, like, I guess that happens that some lawyers may be a little bit, you know, too much of an ego. They might think they're the greatest thing since sliced bread, but they may not either put in the work or they might not really know something. What I like to do is, look, if I, if I don't know something, I like to partner with somebody that does, right? I'm not afraid to partner with somebody. That means I get less money, but we'll do better for the client. It's all about the client. And also, yeah, I think I'm pretty much on the humble side, so that's good. Yeah, just reach out to me. Text me. I'll be happy to help you give you a consult. I'm sorry to hear that you're not getting the, uh, you know, the type of representation that you need from your lawyer. And then Reginald Williams commenting about another video says one year of treatment yikes i hope it's a large policy yeah i mean one year of treatment is a lot so you want to get a large policy so you can get a fair settlement and then mh says my father was in a car accident where he was a pedestrian crossing and the car hit him the car's lights were off he's been hospitalized for two months unable to stand or walk 
bed bound, confined to a wheelchair, and he's receiving intense therapy and rehab. He had a partial disability from a stroke from 2003, but this accident broke a bone in his good leg. He was fully independent prior to this accident. Unfortunately, the driver is a young guy and likely a student, and he only has a minimum 25,000, and this is in New York. And they put the case into a lawsuit, but should we have high expectations? And the whole experience has broken us severely emotionally. Yeah, and I'm really sorry to hear that. I mean, unfortunately, that's the minimum in New York. So it could be that if you take the 25, then if you have more, like for example, if you have 100, once the insurance company tenders the 25, now the tender means they just give you everything, right? They give you the 25. Now you've got the 25 from the young kid who was at fault. Now you can go under insurance UM against your own policy, your household policy. If you have, let's say, 100, you get the difference. You get 75 more. If you have more, you can get even more. If you have a million, you can get like 900 and, you know, what is it, 975 more, right? The difference between the 25 and what you have. So, but otherwise, if it's just a kid, I mean, there could be some exceptions, like if he was driving like his employer's car, if he was working, if he wasn't a student, if he's driving a car for like, you know, like a local pizza shop, delivering pizzas when it happened, and then the pizza shop has a million, you can go after them. But otherwise, I'm not really, not really sure from that uh, quick fact scenario, how else you could, you could do it. But no, I wish you all the best. Uh, hopefully you could get as much as possible because, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's unfortunate. But yeah, I'm hoping they raise the limits. They recently raised the limits for like limousines because there was a really bad limousine crash upstate New York, I think near Albany, and they raised that limit. But now they're, uh, I don't know if they have any plans to raise the 25 limit. 25 is very low. Okay. Okay, and then we have a few comments. Oh, here's here's a final question we can do for today. And it's um, Ricky, and he says, Arcady, what if your attorney tells the jurors something along the lines of, yeah, if my client wins this case, he will be donating 5K to each juror for their time and respect through this procedure. Like, what if they said that with kind of on the lines of the case is worth millions and if they're willing to go forward with fair and just reasonings. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that will be allowed because, you know, the jurors have to be completely impartial. So if you're saying, hey, if you give us money, we're going to give you money, then they have a financial interest in the outcome. So obviously that's not going to be allowed. The judge will get mad and probably declare a mistrial. So you can't do that. But what I have seen happen is that in a trial, an expert, for example, you have an engineer or you have a doctor, like an orthopedic surgeon, right? And the expert will testify and they'll ask him or her, you know, isn't it true that you're getting paid $10,000 to be here? And then the expert, if it's true, could say something along the lines of, look, yes, I am getting paid 10,000, but this is something I only do a few times a year and I don't take that money for myself. What I do is I, I have a charity and I take that 10,000 and I give it to charity. And jurors like something like that because it shows like this expert is really in it because he or she wants to be honest and he wants to help people. And this is like one of their patients or a treating doctor and, and they're not in it just to pocket this 10,000. They're in it, you know, for, because they have a foundation or they're giving it to charity for, for whatever, whatever the cause is, right? That has been allowed because, you know, I, th I think that has been allowed. Although recently on one of these list serves, I saw that the defense, the insurance company, was making a motion, a motion in limine, which is to limit evidence, and they're actually precluding or asking the judge to preclude and not allow an expert to say that. Uh, so we, we, I don't know what the outcome of that is. I think that might be state-specific. State actually, it'd be interesting to research that. But so something like that has been allowed in the past, and I've heard of that happening. But with saying that you're going to pay the jurors, no, you can't, you can't do that, obviously, because, you know, paying the jurors is obviously like... Uh, a financial um, motive. There's a lot of things you can't do in trial. For example, one thing you can't do is like there's a golden rule violation, right? So you can't say something like, imagine if this happened to you, what would you want? Because then it's considered too prejudicial because then the juror starts imagining, oh my God, what if this happened to me? Uh, you know, if I had, had to have a fusion, oh my God, I'd probably want $10 million. So I'm going to give you $10 million. But you could use words like imagine or imagine this happens to you know, someone, you just can't put them in the shoes of your of your client. That's the golden rule violation. There's a lot of things, but this would definitely be 
not allowed, like donating money to the jurors. But I, I like it. It's a good question. It's a, also something that probably is a fun, uh, fun, funny question, maybe for one of the shorter platforms like TikTok or Instagram. So I, mean, I might use that. Okay. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much. I think we're pretty much up to date. This last question that we just asked was only two hours ago. So we're current, which is good. And we're going to do a bunch of more content for you. And let us know what you want to see. Um, like and subscribe to our channel. Uh, feel free to fill out that form if you need a consult. Just let us know. Are you just wanting to like pick our brain? Or are you uh, seriously considering hiring a lawyer? Um, you know, whatever it is, we'll try to get back to you. And uh, I might even try to schedule a little bit of time throughout the week, like almost like office hours where I could, you know, call people or schedule consults because we're getting a lot. And, or I might have other people from our team because we have a firm of about 20 people. Other people from our team try to help out as well. So we get to everybody's questions. And um, yeah, just like, please like and subscribe to our channel. Let us know what questions or what video topics you want in the future. So we could do that for you. You know, whatever you guys need, whatever you guys want, because it's all about you. It's all about the viewer. That's who this channel is for. So we are here for you. Okay, have a great day, everyone, and bye-bye.